Hallelujah. Happy Valentine, everybody. <laughs> that was weak. That was lame. Happy Valentine, everyone. Now, why don't you just go ahead, turn to the person next to you and tell them Happy Valentine. If it's your girlfriend, mean it from your heart and look at them in the eyes. Praise the Lord. In honoring the Valentine season, let me quote to you. Now, I know of a couple whose theme song is this. I said, it sounds, sounds nice. But then I was like looking at the chorus of that song. I said, let me share to you the chorus of the song. The title of the song is, How Deep Is Your Love? Right, How Deep Is Your Love? So the chorus goes like this. <laughs> the chorus goes, how deep is your love? How deep is your love? I really mean, <laughs> I really mean to learn. Because we're living in a world of fools. Breaking us down when they all should let us be. We belong to you and me. That's a chorus. I was going to share it with you the entire lyrics. It sounds so good, right? But if you look at, the, if you look at that song, honestly speaking, I'm, uh, you know, it's looking at, this song is asking something that is very important. The depth of your love. And it's also pointing out something that I'd like to point out today that's very important also, but it's very unpleasant. What is that? It's called the world of fools breaking us down. The breaking down of their relationship. Again, there's a lot of truths in that. The breaking down of relationships. The breaking down of relationships have so much to do or has so much to do with the depth of love. Do you agree with me? You agree with me? The breaking down of marriages, the breaking down of families... The breaking down of churches, the breaking down of friendships, and every other relationship where love is involved has to do with how deep your love is. So today I'd like to ask a question to start with, how deep is your love? How deep is your love between you and your spouse? How deep is your love in your family? How deep is your love in the church? How deep is your love in your homes, among your relatives, and all of those things? I'm going to share this with you because this is very important. Please, as I said, prepare your heart. Because I believe God is going to minister to us today in a very powerful way. So you want to be ready for this. The first thing I'd like to share with you is this truth. We ought to keep ourselves in our love pure. We ought to keep ourselves in our love pure. You see Hebrews 13 verse 4. This is what it says from the New International Version. Marriage should be honored by all, and a marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So you look at that verse. In this verse, the context is marriage, at least this verse. And it first points out a truth that is immensely, <clears throat> sorry, immensely important. It says their marriage should be honored by all. And that word honored, and look at it, what does it mean? Like marriage should be honored. It's something way, way deeper than the surface definition we have. If you look at the word honor there, when he says marriage should be honored, it actually means, it could mean being valuable or costly, esteemed, beloved, dear, precious, and more. Like the, the profundity of, of this definition or meanings is very important right now <clears throat> in its application because honestly speaking, the world does not see marriage as something that is very important or precious or a treasure or costly or valuable. It's not a necessity for the world. Isn't that true? Like I've, You probably heard people say this. And you probably have watched a lot of movies where the main characters, after like almost at the end part of it, they talk to each other, and what do they say? The fact that I love you is enough. We don't really want to get married. We don't have to get married. And the way the movies are portraying that is that they're standing on something, or that their stand is very noble. Well, yeah, that's true. Love is what matters. Forget about marriage. That's what the world is showing us today. And that's something that we know runs contrary or diametrically in a head-on collision against what God says 
about love and marriage. Okay? So this, we, we look at the honorability of the love or marriage that we have. And then if you look at that verse again, somehow the context of purity here is the marriage bed. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. So if you look at it, the word kept took got my attention. Because kept means what is already what, what it already is, you just have to let it be. So that means to say marriage in the eyes of God is pure already. And then marriage bed in the eyes of God is pure already. The encouragement of God for married people is just that we keep it that way. So another implication of this is if God tells us to keep it that way, that means to say there's a possibility to make that bed defiled. And there's a possibility not to keep it pure. And God did not leave it to our imagination. The Bible is very clear cut about it. How do we make the marriage bed defiled? Okay, you continue with that verse. It says, for God will judge. This is the suggestion there. This is what makes it defiled and impure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Very clear from the word of God. So how do you define? When you look at, when you look at the word adulterer, that word adulterer basically means any sexual engagement or activity. Are you hearing me? You know what I'm talking about, right? Any sexual engagement or activity that is outside of marriage for married people. If you're married, you commit adultery if you're having this sexual activity outside of your marriage. And then the other one is like, in every other thing, basically it's like this particular specific sexual sin for married people and then every other sin sexually is making the bed undefiled and you look at all those things that the world actually has you look at sexual engagement and this is something that the bible actually mentioned and still carries over i believe you look at all those other illicit ungodly sexual activities like sex with an animal sex with a dead person sex with the same gender was sex with an immediate family member or relative. And I believe it also prohibits sex with a child or a baby. And like, Pastor, that is so obvious. Why do you point out the obvious? Well, because in our world today, apparently what's obvious for many of us is not obvious to the world. Because there are those who does have or do do have and commit sexual engagements with babies. And you see the sockets of their eyes like black and bruised because somehow the veins of their eyes pop out when they're being... Oh. Okay, let me move on. First Peter 1.22 Because the context of the first one we talked about, which is honorable and pure, has to do with marriage. But purity and honorability of love, the depth of love, does not only belong to the married people, but to everybody in every relationship. You see that in 1 Peter 1.22. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls, obeying the truth. This is the Bible, guys. Okay, the world's saying a lot of things there. This is what the Bible says. And I pray that after today, we will all take it more seriously than we've ever had before. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Again, this verse is speaking of purity. Um, specifically, according to that, seeing you have purified your souls. But again, it's beyond marriage because it doesn't mention marriage here. But I want you to look at the words that describe the kind of love here for each other. The first word is unfeigned. The second one is pure. And I'll look at it. What does having unfeigned love of the brethren mean? Okay, unfeigned love. I want you to, sometimes we don't understand. I want you to look at the person with you that you know you share love affair with, a love relationship with, and tell them, I love you unfeignedly. I have an unfeigned love for you. You think, 
What does that mean? This is what it means. Listen, are you here? It means sincere. You've got to have a sincere love. Genuine. Without dissimulation or hypocrisy. It means to say our love for each other as brothers and sisters, as family members, outside, which is not marriage, but even marriage, it's got to be sincere. It's got to be real. It's got to be true. It's not fake. And also that word pure carries the notion of being deep. There you go. How deep is your love? Our love ought to be sincere, true. It's not fake. It's not shallow. It's deep. That's the kind of love we got to be sharing with each other. And the second thing, we're going to come back here. Because a lot of times, you know, it's like when you look at, when you look at superficial, what makes love impure really? If you look at that word impure, we look at adultery, sexual immorality. It's like you look at that as filth. It's filthy. In any other love relationship, what makes it unfeigned and or sincere what, what makes it impure has to do with that, filth. It has to do with dirt. I'm going to go back to that later, but I'm going to share to you the second part first, okay? Second point. We ought to keep our love transparent. I ought to keep our love transparent. Maybe a light word for you, but when, you, when I look at that word transparent there, I'm talking about, in this study at least, intentional observability. Everybody say that. Intentional observability. What I mean by that is our love for each other as husband and wife, our love for each other in any other relationship is so pure, so true, so precious, so real, so deep that we want people to see that. We want to be so transparent and see through that people are able to see that love that we have so that it becomes an example to the world and to those who don't know what's going on with love. Who don't know what's love got to do with it? Who doesn't know what's, what the definition is and how we have to apply it? They look at you, they look at me, and they see the beautiful love, the true love, the unfeigned love we have, the precious love we carry, the deep love we have, and they go, that's what I want to copy. God, God wants us to have that. First Timothy 4.12, you know this verse. It says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example, everybody say example, of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and purity. There are a lot of virtues here that Timothy was told by his father in the faith, Paul, of what to be an example in. But one of them is love, and we're going to focus on that one. That word example, when, when Paul tells Timothy, or God tells you and me, I want you to be an example of love, of unfeigned, precious, true love. What does it mean? That word example has this meaning or notion, okay? This is from Strong's, okay, Concordance or Dictionary. Quote, by implication, think about, about, about example. By implication, let me read it first. A stamp or scar, by analogy, a shape that is a statue, figuratively style or resemblance, specifically a sampler or type that is a model for imitation or instance for warning, fashion, figure, form, manner, pattern, print. That means example. Okay, so let me put ourselves here. Looking back at that, Paul was telling Timothy, and this is true with every believer, believer be thou an example, be, an, be a stamp of true, pure love. Be a carving of true pure love. Your life in love ought to be the very carving or a shape. Your love, you, you, your love is that shape of what true love is. Your, your love is the statue, the figure, the resemblance of what a true love is. Your love ought to be the sampler or the type or the model for what a true love, deep love, pure love is. That is to be imitated, a model to be imitated. Or instance, I'm sharing this. I want you to ask yourself, is this the kind of love I have that I'm practicing with every person or every entity or every group or every partnership that I share? Is this the kind of love that I'm having in this relationship? It is an instance. Basically, you are the happening of pure love. 
fashion. You're the fashion of pure love. This is good. You're the figure of true love. You're the form, a manner, or pattern of true love. You're the print out of true love. That's us being an example. Okay? It's like Paul is telling Timothy, I want you, Timothy, and it applies to all Christians, I want you, children of God, I want you, church, to be the very personification of true, precious, deep love. In your words and in your being. That's what Paul was saying. Okay, That's the reason why, by the way, again, living and teaching. Whatever we have learned, whatever we live out, God asks us to teach it as well. Titus 2, 1 and 2, this is what it says. You, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older, older man to be temperate, worthy of self-respect, Worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Okay? Whatever you're experiencing and learning, living it out, teach it to other people as well. Okay? The title of the message that I have today is Love, Precious, and Pure, and dash the veil. The veil. And the reason why I did that is because this is a symbol in marriage. When you're getting married, you have the veil a lot of times. Last year, I preached about the ring. I don't know if you remember that. But today I preach about the veil. But when you look at the veil, it basically conveys what I'm talking about today. It's white, talking about purity. And it's transparent, it's see-through. That's what the veil represents. That's what our topic is today. Honorability, purity, the depth of love and transparency. And if you look at a love that shows us that, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. How true, how pure, how precious, how deep the love of Jesus is. Because honestly speaking, his love was tried. Jesus' love is not something we honor and glorify because somebody told us about it without any proof. We read about it, we learn about it. His love for us, how deep it is, how precious it is, how much of a treasure it is was tried and tested, and it came out pure as gold. You know that Jesus could have given up any time? The moment he came to earth, and he saw how bad earth was, and how different the status was between him ruling as king of kings, and then being born in a place where there was not even a place for him that's de decent, but being born in a manger... Jesus could have already given up right there and then, but he did not. He kept loving you. As he grew up, he experienced a lot more things like limitations of a human being. He hungered, he thirsted, he had to work. He could have given up, but his love was pure. He did not. He kept loving. Then when he started like being accused of wrong things and he was under that kangaroo court, Jesus could have given up his love for you, but he continued because his love was deep. It was not easily like uprooted. And then when he started smacking him, hitting him with a rod on the head over and over, he was bloodied and bruised to the point that you could not recognize him anymore when he was being like hit with a whip with a cat and nine tails that the Bible describes him to us as like you do not even recognize him as a human being. That bad, Jesus could have given up any time but the problem is, his love was not shallow. He kept loving you. He kept loving us. He kept going. And I was reading Psalm 22 in my devotion the other day. It was like, I know that was a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things there. Then something struck me with it. I, I read that so many times. How come I forgot? That? How come it, it slipped me? Psalm 22 is a prophecy. It's like almost the, the, the vision. They said it's a... I'm not too sure about this, if it's real, but you know, you know it's got to be the cross. The vision of Jesus on the cross. There's a part in Psalm 22 which says all his bones were showing. He could have stopped any time. But his love was true. His love was precious. His love was pure. His love was deep. That's why he kept going. He could have stopped on his way. He was already like bloody, bruised. 
And he had to walk the Via Dolorosa. He could have stopped any time in that journey to Calvary. But he did not. When they were trying to crucify him, nail him on the cross, nail his hands, nail his feet. He could have just called. He said in his word, I could call legions of angels. I could call 12 legions of angels. He could have done that any time, but he did not. That's the beauty of Jesus. His love was so transparent, it was so visible. He taught it as well. You know that Jesus actually said, God loves you. He told Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. He was talking about love. He was teaching it. He was telling other people about it. The question I'd like to ask ourselves is that, how pure is our love for each other? How deep is our love? How precious is our love? How true, how exemplary it is. And the reason I'm asking that is because my heart breaks with the fact that there's, we have more than enough wives whose hearts are broken. We have more than enough husbands who have been hurt and battered and shattered. We have more than enough families who have fallen apart. One so precious, one so pure, one so great, fallen apart, disintegrating. We have so many churches that are falling apart. It could go on and on. And the reason why I believe it all my heart is because of the misunderstanding regarding what love is. The purity is not there. The depth is not there. The foundation of what real love ought to be is not there. And it's Valentine. Usually Valentine, the message has to do with love, courtship, and marriage. So I don't want to forget the young people, the non-married people. So let me address you for about a few seconds, <laughs> or a few minutes. Your foundation in your love relationship will matter even after you get married. The foundation you put up today will determine the structure you build on it when you get married. And so you've got to be very careful what foundation you, you are building in this marriage relationship. It feels so flattering when you're being invited sometimes by your girlfriend or boyfriend to do something that is illicit, to do something that is immoral because, oh, he's mine. This, this, this somehow solidifies it. She's mine. This somehow solidifies it. He's mine. And the problem is you're setting up yourself with this foundation that is immoral, false. Don't you ever think, don't you ever believe, don't you ever be deceived by the enemy or by yourself or your opinion that setting up a foundation like this before you get married will somehow exempt you and that it's not going to carry on when you get married. Listen carefully. If you're building up a relationship where you're training your partner to do something wrong and immoral with you, the moment you get married, he or she will do that with somebody else. Immoral. Because, because they don't care or you don't care about God's word. If you don't care about God's word today, as boyfriend and girlfriend, unmarried people, don't think that he's going to care about God's word when somebody's flirting. Whew. So what happened to true love? What happened to the precious love? What happened to the depths of love? At times, you know, it's like sometimes the depth of love, we are going to have challenges. Listen carefully. Our relationships, our marriages, our families, our friendships, the church, we will have challenges. We will be challenged. And at times the challenge, especially in marriage, the challenge starts with something very simple. It may be a sticky glimpse. Glimpse, but sticky. It may be a simple smile that you start feeling good about. It may be because somebody in your workplace is showing something to you that your wife or your husband doesn't show to you. And you start moving towards that direction. 
It may just be as simple as that. And then you give in to it. You do something impure, filthy, dirty. And now, whether you get, get found out or not, most of the time they keep, you keep on going or people keep on going until they get found out, right? That's what happened to me. I'm not going to talk to you about it. That was a long time ago. I've been delivered, saved, sanctified. Where am I? You get found out. That's the time you had. You know what? It's so funny because you get found out, but instead of humbling yourselves or humbling themselves and repenting and doing right, what happens is they try to people justify themselves by looking for fault in the other person. This is true in the family, husband and wife. This is true with church. This is true with friendships and many other relationships where love is involved. So what happens is I want to justify my filth and my dirt. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for dirt on you. I'm going to, get, I, I, I'm going to keep on digging dirt on you. And I'm going, to, I'm going to start throwing dirt at you. I'm going to, I'm going to involve myself in, in more and more mud slinging. So that my filth will not be seen, but it's your filth that will be seen. And if, I, and if I can't find a lot of filth in you, I will make things up. The person may not have a lot of faults or serious faults, but I convince myself because I'm making up something that I am starting to believe that's you. And that happens in a lot of relationships. Start throwing dirt at each other. And the marriages, is, marriages, families, something comes up. Like the, the Bible says, let no one put asunder. And this is true in every relationship. But an entity, a situation comes up. And what was, what was once so beautiful and so precious, something so elevated, something you honored so much, something so deep, suddenly is losing its value. You don't care about your marriage anymore. You don't care about your wife anymore. You don't care about your husband anymore. You don't care about your church anymore. You don't care about your family anymore. You don't care about your mom. You don't care about your siblings. You don't care about this anymore because now I'm focused on this thing that, that somehow made this other relationship that I grew up with, that I, that I invested my whole life in. It's now so shallow and it's now so cheap. You know, I heard this before that, I just where we read it, that from, night, from 2011 to 2020, for one decade, there is an average of low about 4,000, high about 8,000 churches that close. Every year. Low 4,000 only from 34 Christian denominations. They have reasons that may be reasonable. But what breaks my heart is in many of those churches, the reason why they came to that point, just because of people. Throwing dirt at each other. That caused the demise of the church. And when I say this, when I say the church closed, I don't want us to think of brick and mortar. The, the walls, the building. When I say the church closed, we're thinking about the body of Christ. We're thinking about the flock. We're thinking about 4,000 to 8,000 flocks are displaced because of mud slinging. And the sad part about it is some people make their way, but there are those who don't make their way back to fellowship. Just because a lot of times is something so small 
just a difference in preference. And we went at it to the cost of a church or churches closing. And the sad part about these things is we don't care. There are people who are happy that the church they went to before and they attacked are closed. Because they forgot that the church is Jesus. Saul, Saul, why have you persecuted me? Why do you persecute me? Saul was persecuting the church and Jesus said, you are persecuting me. And when people are happy that the churches are diminishing in numbers because I don't like that church. You are taunting Christ. The church of Jesus, that, that church is the flock of Christ. That flock is you. You are hurting. We are hurting. The church is hurting. The body of Christ is hurting. Jesus is hurting. This goes on with friends, families, and all that. You could move in any, in any relationship where there's, where there's love involved. I just, I'm just illustrating church because this is so, it's so sad and yet it's so rampant. In Christendom, I'm sad to say. Criticism. A pastor criticizing another pastor. A flock criticizing another flock. A sheep criticizing another sheep. A denomination criticizing another denomination. All a part of the family of God. And we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're winning the world, we're battling. Jesus Christ said, don't, don't get me wrong here. Jesus Christ said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So here we are as a church, battered, bruised, wounded, our armor ripped open in parts, not because the world attacked you and me, but because a friendly fire hit us. Over and over and over. In a very weak standpoint, a very weak position, bruised, battered, hurt, unable to move almost, we're fighting our battle. And we're moving forward in victory by the grace of God. We're fighting, we're gaining grounds. But a question I like to ask is, what if the church was healthy? What if the church was strong? What if the armor was intact? How far would we have gone? I really don't want to cry. Just because we wanted to air my grievance. That's the cost. You know what? I'm believing for something better. I'm believing for something better for every family here. I'm believing for something better for every marriage. I'm believing for something better for FCF. I'm believing for something better for your friendships and every other love relationship you have. And I believe we can do it. Well, later, okay, please. I'm sorry. Is it okay? Is it okay if I ask for a few more minutes? I believe we can do it. I believe we can love purely without the simulation, deeply. And we could honor these love relationships again like a treasure before us. Because the love of God is flowing through you and me. The love of Jesus Christ that never gave up is flowing in you and in me. And because this love is flowing in you and in me, we know if Jesus did it, we can do it. It's time we fight for our, hus for our husbands. It's time we fight for our wives. It's time we fight for our marriage. It's time we fight for our church. 
It's time we fight for our friendships. Hey, you're not yet tied. You have not tied a knot yet, but if you understand each other, you're for each other. It's time to fight for your boyfriend or for your girlfriend. I don't hear any amen from you guys. No, no, Pastor, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight. I'm just going to settle with this. Shallow. You've got the love of God flowing through your veins. That's going to get you somewhere. Amen. Nothing can separate you from that love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That ought to be the truth inside of us as well. Nothing can separate us from our love relationship with anybody in this love relationship. Amen. Tribulation does not like, just because we're suffering tribulations or hardship doesn't mean that God is not loving on us. In tribulation, let me assure you, God loves you. In distress, let me assure you, God loves you. In famine or nakedness or peril or danger or sword, let me assure you, God loves you. Nothing can stop God from loving you. Nothing can uproot God's love. Amen? Not height, heights or angels, it's not going to stop God from loving you. Demons, they're not going to stop God from loving you. The past is not going to stop God from loving you. The present is not going to stop God from loving you. The future is not going to stop God from loving you. Nothing in all creation is going to stop God from loving you. Nothing and no one, anytime, anywhere, is going to stop God from loving you. And if that's the kind of love that's flowing through you and me, I have high hopes for our love. I have high hopes for our marriages. I, pray, I have high hopes for Marlene and Paul. Because they know, they know the love of God. They know the love of God that needs to flow through us is that. It's precious. Precious and true and pure and deep. I have high hopes for your families. Amen. I have high hopes for a church. Instead of throwing, instead of throwing dirt on each other. Oh my goodness, you know what the Bible tells us? See, a lot of times our dirt, the, the dirt we throw like, is because of a very simple, small thing. And a lot of times we fight with our wife or we fight with our family members because we heard somebody say something about that person saying something or doing something wrong. We're not sure, we didn't see it, we're not witnesses, but we believe it. Ooh, he's evil. She's evil. I don't like her anymore. We don't even take the common sense step of there's another side of the coin. Can I hear you first? I want to be just as God is. Can I hear your side of the story? We don't even attempt it, but we start showing animosity and anger and hatred towards other people. Are you here with me? Families and, and marriages and churches are falling apart based on hearsay. We know better. As I said a lot of times, it's not real. Just People just make up stories because I want to justify myself. So I create stories about you and we believe it. You know what the Bible says? And we come across a lot of times, we come across other people and we approach other people. And it's like we want to charge. Not to do what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says? Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Come here. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you, which are spiritual, condemn that sinner. Is that what it says? You knew that's not what it said, right? 
You which are spiritual. You which are doing better. You which are doing good in your walk with God. Restore. Restore. Restore such an one in the spirit. Now this, this person is not just here say, doing something wrong. The Bible said even if this person is guilty of wrongdoing, you do not condemn, you, good, you do not shoot them down, you do not step all over your wife, all over your husband. Restore them in the spirit, not a pride of arrogance. Restore them in the spirit of meekness and humility. I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation, but we're not done. For those of you who'd like to enjoy the beauty of the beautiful love, the beauty of love that God has for us, I want you to follow me in this prayer. Receive Jesus in your life as Lord and Savior. And those of you who have done this before, do it for the first time. I mean, do it supporting those doing this for the first time. And I'll talk to you afterwards. Follow after me, those of you who are doing this for the first time and those supporting them. And please be encouraging when you follow, that there be depth in you following. That there be sincerity in you trying to encourage other people. We mean business in this, amen? So just follow me in this prayer. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for your pure love, your precious love, your true love for me that never gave up on me. Lord, I need your salvation. I sin against you. So I open my heart to you now. And I invite you. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.